try and get through as many no's as you possibly can. Because the more no's you hear, the closer you are to a yes. And then on the back side. We all have the best time ever to start a small business. If I'm not gonna be 100% in, I'm not gonna do it. Come on, man, just be yourself. Yeah, and, like, and just show up as yourself. If you don't realize what I'm really about, I'm about freedom, family, and my country. Mr. Egger, welcome. Mr. Robbins. To our brand new Fireside America podcast set. How'd we do? Not bad. It speaks for itself, dude. This is really cool. Shout out to VIP Landscaping and Mike and his whole entire team. Um, I made them rebuild this wall twice. I had a vision <laughs> in my mind. The team had a vision in their mind. And uh, we wanted to have the biggest, baddest podcast set in America, if not the world. We're on a mission to help as many people as we can. Most people don't turn around and help the next girl or guy in line. That leads me to why you, why you are here tonight. You are probably one of the most generous guys I've come across, especially in the finance space. Majority of them are not. They are greedy. Um, and you do nothing but give to the people in the ecosystem of the pit. Fireside, as you know, this is my passion project. It's not how I feed my family either. Yep. And you saw me, you know, drowning at times at some of these large events and helping others. And you've done nothing but step up and help. You also have a very successful story yourself with you and your partner, Lewis, in business. And uh, I want to give you this opportunity to talk a little bit about yourself because you do nothing but help others. Cool. So welcome to the set. Thank you. So where'd you grow up? So we're going to hit pause for a second. I was paused. We're going to start out with the grab assing and the compliments. I got to give you some too, right? I, mm -hmm. If you want to. I, I think a... somebody's got to say congratulations to you, right? Because this house, this property, this set, what Fireside has become, it's really truly the product of like somebody having vision and putting hard work and day in and day out, seeing it come to fruition, right? Um, and as somebody who's been a good friend for the last handful of years, and rooting for you and in your corner, I'm super proud of what you've been able to accomplish, right? And it's great to see a friend do that. It's even cooler to see somebody who's built up a following, built up a persona online, who's actually doing the work day in and day out, right? Because you see these fake fuck charlatan business coaches online. There's a lot they're of talking them. a lot about it, but they're not doing it. And dude, I've seen you fight tooth and nail to get where you are. And I know it wasn't easy to get here, it sure as hell isn't easy to hold the line that you're holding. I believe in you, and I know that it's going to get easier, but just, dude, congratulations. Dude, I appreciate it, but I, I can't say I didn't do it without Kelly, Matt, CK, Trevor, Dami. I mean, we sold our house, had nowhere to go, oh. went to the mountains, people were watching our dogs. Um, it was a total communal effort, including you. You know, most people don't know, but sliding into this house, I don't put things up to be like, yo, I'm rich, I'm this, mm -hmm. I'm that, I got fake helicopters. Like, no, I do this to try to inspire people because I was a kid who was kicked out of high school and no one thought I would accomplish a thing. Yeah. And as my come up, I didn't see many people turning around. And that's what, again, this is all about. But, you know, at one point I had to amend my taxes and pay another 50 grand there and put another 125,000 down. And that wasn't in the budget. Right. You know, I sold my house for a large, you know, equity piece but um it was not budgeted into what we wanted to do and then we got into the house and had to get this done and for those of you who don't know boulders are way more expensive than i ever realized but shout out to lucas brothers and derek from se arms because we got a really good hookup on the boulders yeah but it was a team effort it was not just me i was the vision yes i'm driving the ball down the field but i could not do it without, without all of you as well as you as well thank you thank you Second congratulations, right? This may even be bigger than that. You got conservative. There's too many compliments in a row. You got like conservative, this. corporate, introverted Chris Edgar to come on the podcast. Took a couple years. For your audience, most of which I don't know, I've never done anything like this and it's extremely uncomfortable, right? Um, I'm really happy to be here. I consider it an honor to be your first choice. Maybe not your first choice, but first available this week at the new no, set. No, you're my first choice. Okay, I'll take it. So a lot of people that were on the waiting um, list. Thank you. So I consider it an honor, right? Um, and I'm really excited to be here for it. Yeah, we're going to crush. Uh, this year has been a little rocky, a little sloppy with the podcast. Not as consistent. We, we fired our old content team. 
both grew apart, went separate ways, and then we're kind of finding different people to shoot this, and it's been a lot. And then we had the move, and then the construction. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're ready to get consistent and really continue to use the podcast for good out there. Absolutely. And anybody who thinks that I'm not doing that, come come meet me. You know, come hang around, see what we're doing. Friday's um, eight thirty. Coffee. Yeah, one of the new things you guys will see in a real. If you haven't seen it already by the time you watch this, but everybody comes and shoots a crossbow safely, um, and you got to hit the target. If you hit the target in the center, Fireside's going to donate each week 500 bucks to Children's Specialized Hospital. If the guests would like to match, uh, like you did tonight, um, you know, we're going to have them do that. We're going to do some fun stuff like that to just continue to give back, give back, give back. Absolutely. And uh, we're very, very, very amped to do that, as you know. Um, so let's get back to you. Okay. Too many compliments in a row. It makes me <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, where did you grow up? So you want the rundown, right? You know the rundown. Let's, let's give the people the rundown, right? So I was born in 1986 in Staten Island. My parents immediately transplanted me or transplanted me to Middletown where I grew up. Um, I'm an only child. I'm the son of my dad, Dave, who was a bond trader my entire life, and my mom, Cindy, who's a therapist. Those three factors there, right, only child, therapist, bond trader, I think it put me in a really unique position to do pretty well in the things that I've pursued so far. Um, today, I live in Brielle, beautiful town in southern Monmouth County by, uh, by the ocean um, with my wife, Nicole, who's my college girlfriend, our three boys, Connor, Caden, and Colin. And uh, I'm really fortunate to be in the position in life, I think, where we are. I'm really grateful. I'm a lot different, I think, than most of the hundred some odd guests that you've had on the podcast so far because this podcast is about entrepreneurship, right? It's about people that go out, hang their own shingle, grind it out, create their own business. And I don't own a business. But you do. Right. I would identify, right, in 2024 terms as an entrepreneur, right? You could for, identify as anything you desire. For those in the audience that aren't necessarily familiar with the term, that's somebody that essentially runs their own practice, runs their own P&L inside a greater organization, right? And for me, um, that's Bank of America Merrill Lynch. And I had a nice conversation with the compliance folks before I came here today to kind of give me the guardrails of what I can and High can't compliance. say. Brian has the luxury of not having to worry about that anymore. I still maintain my, li my licenses. Um, and what they counseled me is kind of keep it to what's on your business card or your website, right? So. If you read Chris's business card, it would say Christopher Edgar, SEMA, CRPC, Senior Vice President, Wealth Management Advisor, right? The hell does that mean? I, exactly. All that really means is I'm fortunate to run a really cool practice uh, with my partners, Lewis Perlman and Courtney Hogan, who I've only worked with for the entirety of the 15, 16 years of my career, to help a bunch of families locally and across 40 some odd states in the country to help manage their financial affairs. Um, it's been an interesting road to get there. You know. Um, a very average story by some regards and then above average in others. Um, but it's been a cool journey and it's one that's still ever evolving. So I want to go to you being an only child. Totally. So a lot of times that could be something that maybe is a negative as you grow up, right? And it may or may not be in every different situation. But one of the first things that you and I did together was a Peloton competition. <laughs> and in this Peloton competition, we had another friend that uh, was texting me on the side like, hey, is Chris like you? You brought this guy to this competition. He's, he's, <laughs> he's very mean in the group text. And most of you maybe who don't know me, I'm pretty thick skin and Irish guy. I like to talk shit. And uh, what was really cool about all of that is we had a conversation a few months after that mm -hmm. at DV Tree one morning. And you were like, Ryan, hit me with my blind spots, more or less. Totally. And it was about the competitor and instantly you were open-minded to constructive feedback yeah and that's absolutely. extremely rare you see that only in people who really have excelled at life as well as their own personal development mm -hmm. as man husband wife friend etc and right away i was like you know i really like this dude and you were so thankful to me and most people yeah. who don't know me i really like to help i truly care uh i had someone recently say to me like Ryan, you really care about helping other business owners. Like, like I'm not even busting your chops. You really care. And I'm like, yeah, I do. Of course I do. He's like, I don't give a shit. I just want to make money to take care of my family. Right. You know, it's not a bad thing that you do, but it's, it's rare. And suddenly I recognize that, or instantly I should say, in you to mm -hmm. just want to get better 
and then turn around and help that, you know, with the next person in the pit as well as in your world. Yeah. So, again, another reason why you're here on the podcast. Well, dude, so the cool thing about friends and relationships that are genuine people is they'll tell you the stuff that you don't necessarily want to hear, but you need to, right? And you gave me feedback that I asked for. It's probably a good opportunity to listen, right? And what I'd be really happy to say is, is that's been something that's been instrumental for me for the last couple of years is just checking that, right? You know, for all my only children out there, like, I think some of your most redeeming qualities come as a result of being an only child. And then some of the things that you'd bitch to a therapist about that are like ailing for you might be attributable to that as well, right? But as it figures into myself, the way I run my family, the way I run my business, you know, the endeavors that I've pursued, a lot of that is attributable to the skill set that I had growing up, not having siblings, having to go out there and kind of figure yeah, it out and own. figure out how to make friends. And There's good and bad and You're older. instantly slightly more mature than you really are for your age group. And that plays into me as a 22-year-old kid fresh out of college in the depths of the financial crisis, like knocking on 55-year-old Mr. Smith's door saying, hey, can I help manage all your money for you? Yeah, that's a tough road. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's not easy. Or cold calling. No. So, it still works, though. It's not allowed to do it. <laughs> once you had come around and you started to kind of like sniff around the edges, what's this guy writing about? What's this podcast about? What did you think about the podcast? What did you think about the ecosystem? So we got introduced through your friend, Phil Vitillo, who's a longtime childhood friend of yours. Phil and I did CrossFit for Great 10 guy. years together. Awesome guy. Um, he still looks like he does CrossFit. I look like I quit 10 years Phil ago. Looks, he, can, he can eat like French <laughs> toast, absolute garbage, and he still looks thin. Some guys got it, some yeah. don't. Make up for it in personality on some days, I don't know. Um, but for years, Phil was like, oh, you got to meet my friend Ryan. He does what you do, kind of, but he's in the insurance world, and you guys would get along. And I'm like, no. No. And then he was on your podcast. You started like, looking oh. me up because you're competitive. What license does yeah, he have? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let, me look his at, house? let me look at his stuff. And <laughs> it's like, oh, I saw the podcast with Phil. I'm like, oh, maybe he was right. This is a good guy. Let's connect. And we hit it off. And, you know, I think my dad's here tonight. He could probably attest to it. Shout like, out to Dave. Most of the best friends that I have today started out with this, like, I don't know if we should punch each other in the face or we should hug That's each other. And we started, we started out that way for sure. sure. We were arguing financial instruments um, and strategies, and I'm like, I don't know about this guy. But again, iron sharpens iron, and uh, you were quick to say when you were wrong, as was I. Absolutely. And uh, again, Kelly was just saying it yesterday, how generous you've been to the whole entire group. Trevor, who just walked up, doing a deal with him as a young guy, being an investor. We believed them, but we didn't know what he really had. Yeah, and of course. You stroked the check, and um, I think compliance knows that. Yeah. Just kidding. I it's an outside it's business activity. It was approved. Um, just kidding. But you, again, just super generous, but you were also competitive. I'll give you a quick story about Chris. So when we were first finding a new production team, Chris was talking about cameras, and he was on the Canon kick. Now, every videographer that I've dealt with for the Still last... Still am, to be fair. Every videographer that I've dealt with for two years were all on the Sonys. Mirrorless, this, this, that. I still don't know how to work a camera. And... Chris shows up to my house in the podcast that night with like a new Sony that like it was like three levels up from the ones that we bought. We just spent like 15 grand. Like that's the competitor in you. That's a that's a good thing too. It's not a bad thing. And uh, you needed a third camera. I did. All right. We did. And it speaks to one of my more redeeming qualities, which is I'll admit when I'm wrong. And I realized the Sony sucked and I sold it and got back to Canon. <laughs> <laughs> Just the, saying. Com the competitor is a good thing. When it, the beast needs to be put in the bag, you definitely know how to put it in the bag. But I want to jump more into your story and your college life. Yeah. So you went to high school, Middletown? So I grew up in Middletown. I went to St. John Vianney for high school. Um, had a good time, did my thing, went to Ryder University. Oh, for... sorry, you're going too fast. Okay. What jobs did you do as a younger guy? It's a good question. So speaking to entrepreneurship, right? I remember when I, I, so I was born in 86, I grew up in the 90s, I was big into skateboarding. And I remember going to my parents and I was in middle school and I'm like, hey guys, like, I, I really want this thing, this, this ramp. And they're like, what? And I'm like, CCS mail order was a catalog we used to order everything from and they still exist. They had a kicker ramp, it was this plastic ramp, it was like $120 and they're like, no, like, <laughs> go get some money if you want this. Like, this is ridiculous, you're gonna break your arm. 
And I remember I went to like the middle school guidance counselor, I went to my mom and I was like trying to petition for this like local skate shop to hire me because I wanted to make money so I can get this thing. How were you petitioning them? Like I went to the school, I'm like, can you sign a letter that I can get a job? And they're like, no, you're 13 years old and you have to be 15 and like child labor laws really do exist. And I'm like, but what if you want it? And they're like, no. Um, so I remember coming home one day and I had a conversation with my folks and my dad's like, well, like my law needs to get cut. So like, why don't you go do that? Okay, how's 20 bucks sound? I'm like, got you, old man. He's like, yeah, no problem. Little did I know the other guy was charging him like two times that. But the idea and instantly hit me. I'm like, wait, we live in this like townhome community and like the neighbor's lawns are connected to ours. Like maybe that guy wants his cut. And I was like 12, 13 years old using Pop's lawnmower paying for the gas and just like knocking on door to door. And I did that for like probably 13, 14 years, all through college, all through high school, um, snow, cleaned up in the snowstorms before global warming was the thing. We actually got snow, um, lawn stuff, painting stuff, just whatever odd jobs you could have. But like as a kid, if you get 20, 30 houses within, you know, a half a mile of your house to do it at 30 bucks a pop, that adds up pretty quick. Um, I also grew up working in restaurants, right? So Turning Point, Salt Creek Grill, Oyster Point, like my routine in the summer was like, I'd get up, I'd mow lawns, I'd go to Turning Point and do my you know, nine to three shift there come home, finish out, and then go to like Salt Creek. And like, I'm a 16 year old kid making five, $600 a day doing all that for no reason. Like I grew up in a great lifestyle. My parents took awesome care of me. I had lots of wants, but I had no needs, right? I was very aspirational, but it was just always that pursuit of more kind of financial security. And what I found in this industry is like financial security means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But to me, it always just meant like being able to do what I wanted. Yeah. So like, the so, byproduct of that work was you could do more of what you want. So this is like a, more of a statement than a question yeah. first. I think a lot of people have gotten away from just doing, you know, the hard work. There's a lot of young totally. kids. You can't find servers in restaurants right now. I have a lot of clients that are business owners in that space, and they just can't find a young guy or girl that's willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. What would you say that did for you when you finally got into sales and having to communicate with people as well as the work ethic it taught yeah. you? So as small of a scale as it was, right, it was, I was knocking on strangers' doors, offering them a service, and they would tell me yes or no. Got okay with hearing no, right? I think people struggle with hearing no. I saw something the other day that like salespeople are some of the highest paid people in organizations just because they have the biggest ability to hear no, and that's really what they're being compensated for over and over no to get to the yes. Um, I got to figure out billing. I got to like make my own logos and do all this crazy stuff on like legacy, like 1995 Microsoft Word type stuff. What about the restaurant? Um, the restaurant, same thing, right? It was, you're working in a service capacity to give somebody a great experience. And like there's standards of like what's reasonable tipping in the United States. Now it's on everything, but like it used to be 10, 15, 20% based upon your bill, right? So for me at the time, it was like, how can I elevate the experience of the people that came to enjoy dinner with their family, but not be like too burdensome that like, I can get them a higher ticket that I can get a higher tip on and make them want to come back. And when you spend years and years working in the same place, like you get your regulars and they come in they take care of you and you see them and you have a great experience. Um, you're building relationships. You're building relationships. And those early things are big catalysts for where I am now because what I do now is I manage relationships for families that have needs that we help serve. Now you see young guys in the firm, you see young guys in your town, you probably totally. see some young guys and girls in your family. Would you say that a lot of the young people lack that ability to build relationships nowadays or it's just different? I think it's just different. How? When we were coming up, there was one way. It was like meet people or call people. And now it's a lot more complicated. It's, you can still meet them, you can still call them. People are a lot more closed-minded to both of those things. Everything is digital and it's all in your face 24-7 in those different mediums, right? And I think you've done a good job deciphering some of what that means and being able to have, you know, a digital infrastructure really grow your business and multiple fronts and verticals for you. Um, but I think young guys coming into the business today or just in general the business world, they're like, I don't know which one to do. And you sort of get analysis paralysis. Yeah, so too many options. I spend a lot of time, one of my passions and, and kind of what I do within Merrill is, is I work on this group called the Advisors Growth Network. Got an old bomber going over us right now. Probably the FBI.
We'll give it a minute, <laughs> right? Um, Let him pitch. But I love coaching that next generation that's on the come up. And it's cool when you do that because you see the light bulbs go off because all I'm dropping on them is common sense. And they're here overthinking everything, spinning their wheels for days and days and days. And it's like, well, why don't you just treat these people the way you would want to be treated if you were trying to say to somebody, here's all my money. I trust you, right? Treat people with the standard of care that you would want. Treat them like normal human beings. Don't get weird. Don't overcomplicate this. Like when it comes to building your circles and this of influence, like why are you spending time with your 22 years old at college? Why are you spending your time with 75 year old accountants that think they know everything? Like cultivate a group of people that are like you and grow together. Because they don't want, they're not willing to put in the, the right satisfaction. But over time, when you tell enough of them that, you start to see some of them listen, and then you see it work, and then they come back to you, and you're like, that worked. I'm like, yeah, no, you think? So you pointed out digital infrastructure. Yeah. And would you still say it's very hard for an advisor, because mm -hmm. that's the world that we come from, to utilize social media in the capacity that I do? Absolutely. Why? So for the same reason that I struggle with it, right? Because we're in one of the most highly regulated industries in this country, and rightfully so, because we're in a position where we could help a lot or we could hurt a lot if we don't do the right things. Um, and you get that analysis paralysis, either because you don't know what you can do or what you can say, or because the firms and the compliance and the lawyers are breathing down your neck and they bring it down to such a level where it's ineffective at this point. Like, Part of what makes somebody want to work with an advisor is there's a genuine relationship. There's a genuine trust. There's a genuine level of, I like you, you like me. Coyotes. I hear them. that? Matt, get that crossbow. You hear that? Woo, 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 woo. Right. And your effective use of social media has been through conveying your personality, right? And when you nerf it to the extent that, like, it fits in this box that regulators want, it's ineffective. I got to give some education to the Please. advisors that are in your firm that watch. First off, you're allowed to do a podcast and get on social media and talk about everything but what it is you do to help your That's clients correct. invest their money. So if you want to talk about baseball, football, driving tractors, riding quads, mm -hmm. shooting guns, maybe not guns, but there's a, a plethora of things that you could talk right. about that you have interest in. You then gain those eyes That's and then correct. you could float them over to what it is that you do. And most people don't understand that. Right. So when I have this vertical tree, everything I do is based on business owners, country, and family. Mm -hmm. So anybody who rocks with that is going to fall into right. what I call my funnel. And there's multiple funnels there. There's human funnels. Then there's digital funnels. Mm -hmm. And there's ways for you to go take that audience and move their eyes over. And listen, I see these guys online that try to go the finance route. It's boring. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit here and talk about charitable strategies. Nobody wants and, to hear and this, it. It's boring. No one really wants to do it. A lot of people are not really in love with where they're at financially, whether they have 500,000 or, you know, 25 million. Mm -hmm. People always, you know, would like to be doing something different with their finances right. and you can gain their interest in other areas. Right. So I have Fireside America, I have The Pit, I have WCC, I also have Patriot Payments, I have Roadly Logistics. All of these things is working with business owners and then providing some more mm -hmm. value to them through my digital infrastructure right. and I get paid off of every single one of them. Mm -hmm. Every single time a client goes out with you to play golf, go to a restaurant, have a coffee, that's kind of like what we call an elevator speech. Most people in sales would. Right. Every time I post, I have at least 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. I've had a million views. Mm -hmm. So I have a million, you know, probably that's 5 a lot of cold million. Calls. Yeah, cold calls that are out there every single day yeah. doing something that I enjoy, right. doing something that I have purpose with. So anybody who's out there that is maybe going to watch this in your world, yeah, absolutely. join the pit. I mean, we could teach you to do it legally, especially with compliance. Totally. We're very conscious of, of that game. Next question. So in high school, how did you do? Average. Did you like school? Yeah, I think so. Then you go to college where? I went to Ryder University down in Lawrenceville. Playing, Getting very average. Playing right. sports there? No. What did you study? Finance and entrepreneurial studies. All right, so you hear that? I, I, I thought I had to go to school to learn how to be an entrepreneur. Well, they tell you those types of things, but you don't have to. It was worth the tuition for what it would cost then. But so if, something, if, if a parent's going now and they're, gonna, they're, they're debating, do I want to bring my kid to college? Do I want to give them that money to invest in the business? What would you tell them to do? I think it depends on the kid. Um, you know, for my kids, where I'm investing their money, 
it wants to give them options. I'm not chaining it all to the 529s or to the college ecosystem because I believe in the next 10, 15 years that the structure of our education system changes. It sort of has to. You know, we're operating off an education ideology today that was founded in the mid 1800s by Horace Mann, who was trying to convert the education system from agriculture to industrial production. And now we're in a completely different environment and you're starting to see things break. Um, you know, they got away with it for probably longer than they should have because of the whole Student Loan Act that started in the 60s. And even that's coming back to bite them now, right? Um, so for me, with my kids, I want them to have options. I want to raise them the right way. I think the, the more effectively, the better you raise your kids just to be awesome humans that are well educated in most areas of life instead of just how to be on time and how to be nice to people, but they're critical thinkers. They think outside of the box. They know how to ask thoughtful questions and maybe push against the norm a little bit is good. Um, so I think if in my world, if I can get my kids to where I'd envision them to be at 18 years old, the conversation's like, hey, do you want to go spend whatever it costs at that point in time to go to a four year degree? Or do you want to take this lump sum of money and, and bet on yourself? Um, and I'd love to see that if I could have three business owners instead of three college graduates and they're successful over time. That's a win in my book. Yeah, absolutely. So we get done with college. What did you decide to go do? What was your first job? So I told you, I like, had average grades, which like clearly means I'm really smart. And I thought getting into the finance industry in the middle of the great financial crisis of 08, 09 was the greatest thing ever. Same, 07, um, November. What I'll tell you in hindsight is that's the greatest thing that could ever happen, right? So part of your podcast idea is you always want to give people nuggets. And I think one of the nuggets that I could extrapolate from my come up in this business is you know, when you can launch something in a crisis, especially if you're not the one that created that crisis, you're there to help solve the problems, right? You're instantaneously battle tested, but you're instantaneously also put in front of a group of people who are open to new solutions, new ways, new answers, new relationships. And if you can be on point through that, there's a tremendous opportunity for upside for you there, right? And for us getting into this world in 2008, 2009, think about the number of things that have happened over the last 10, 15 years I've Financial learned, crisis, zero I've interest rate policy, so the taper tantrum, Meredith Whitney Muni bond scare, the world was ending, right? We had the pandemic, we had, you know, five X expansion again. of the Fed's balance sheet, we've got the elections. Like, it's just been one thing after the other at hyper speed. Why are they doing that to us? I don't know. Control? Fear. But on the business side, right, that represents a tremendous opportunity because you're always there to help and you're the one that's been consistently there through all those storms. Bringing solutions. So for me, like I graduated, I didn't know what to do. I had a, I, I, like kids are smart these days and they get lots of internships and figure out what they want. I had one, I worked for Johnson and Johnson in corporate accounting and I was like, this ain't for me. I can't do this. So I worked at a muni bond shop that, you know, was up in North Jersey. I got licensed. I hated my life for the year. Pops the can name? attest to it. I'm not going to get into that, but it was, it really resembled the, that movie Boiler Room. You know, great movie with uh, Giovanni Ribisi, right? Um, not because they were hawking penny stocks, but they were selling muni bonds. But it was, you show up every day at seven o'clock, you leave at seven o'clock at night, you're going to cold call this list of people and try and sell them this thing. And competitive only child Chris is seeing everybody else in the group that's like a war of attrition like making two three hundred cold calls a day I'm like well I can get to 500 if I could do that I could do that I could do that and it just got to the point where I'm like where's where's the future in this thing for me like I know interest rates are going Misery. down I know I'm just hammering these people I'm like this ain't where I want to be so I, I threw in the towel after a year because my folks always told me give it a year and like really give it an honest shot just don't quit on the first week um, and I did well there, but it just, it wasn't the fit. And I had this great idea that I was going to be a lawyer, right? Because I like to argue with people and I'm competitive. And, you know what? Yeah, right? Um, my business partner, Lewis, always jokes with me. He's like, if you didn't have to take the time off to, like, go pay to be educated in this, like, you'd be a great lawyer or a great accountant. Lewis also um, gave you the best compliment ever the other day. Shout out to Lewis. Thank you. He said, Chris is one of the best guys I've ever met in my life. Yeah. And if I took every bit of his assets under management and this business away from him and I dropped him in a random city where he knew nobody, he'd build this thing back up in five years. That's right. And uh, I thought that was one of the best compliments I could ever hear a friend, business partner. Totally. Give to somebody. We've had the most wonderful partnership for the last 15, 16 years. And uh, we got to get Lewis on the show. What we should. Got? We should. We got to get him. The thing about him is, is like outside of my folks, 
he's the person that's always believed in me the most, never questioned it, and still to this day, for some reason, does, right? Um, and that's a special type of person, it's a special type of relationship, right? Um, so I quit the firm, backtrack, I quit the uni bond firm, I went back to the restaurants, I studied for the LSAT. In 2009, everybody thought, let me hide out in law school for four years and spend more mom and dad's money while we figure out this recession thing. And you know, even if you got a great score, I got a pretty good score that would normally get you into a pretty good law school, like I couldn't get into Rutgers Camden. And it just so happened to be that I got a call from a recruiter at Merrill. And I was like, listen, I'm not super interested in this. I tried the finance thing. I know I've got my licenses. They convinced me to come out. They convinced me to meet Lewis. And we hit it off and I started shortly thereafter. And uh, Lewis was a great stepping stone into that business. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's not easy to, to start in our business. I think it's one in 10. And the average advisor is now 57 and creeping up to, you know, probably 60 pretty quick. Totally. Um, it's not an easy industry to be to be able to land on a team and somebody's got an established well, he was just another guy that was figuring it out right he was probably 10 years into the business at that point in time picked up moved his practice and his family out from New York over to you know Manasquan where we are today had a little bit of sticker shock because he's used to like leaving the office and going to Nobo for lunch and now he's like I gotta go to Wawa like what's this thing it's um, much cheaper it's much cheaper and it's also delicious Nobu and scale, like, I don't think right? overrated person. um but wanted to bring in a partner and kind of figure out what that next level of business is. And we hit the ground running. I did what I knew how to do, which was pick up the phone and I'm out. Right? We're gonna take a quick break. Okay. I wanna get into what you learned in the Muni Bond shop, right? Because a lot of times people end up in this unhappy situation. They don't realize the yeah. silver lining that's there. And you learned a lot. I wanna dive into what that is. We're gonna take a quick break and then we'll be back. Let's do it. So hopping back in, I left us, left us off with saying, what did you learn at that first Muni Bond shop that you applied in your new job. And one of the first things that you and I spoke about when we were just exchanging ideas in our business and you know sales and prospecting, you said I did cold calls yeah. to people who were in uh, a C-level suite who maybe had some restricted stock and I wanted to show them if they left mm -hmm. or when they, when they took that, how to do that tax efficiently. And you cold called how many people a day? A lot. How many? Three, four, five, six hundred a day, depending on the day. So I think what a lot of people fail to realize is that job that you hate is getting you ready for your next opportunity. Totally. And something out of that bad situation yeah. is going to help you leap forward in your next endeavor. Totally. And that obviously did for you. So when I did that, right, I was... And, and I want to give people a little, without getting into too much business or numbers, Yeah, I want to paint a picture for those who don't know as an entrepreneur what you do. It's not easy to bring on $100 million of assets under management. And we don't no. want to go into how much your team has, but it's much, much more than that. And it's extremely hard as a young kid mm -hmm. who's trying to sit there and go, hey, let me manage your assets. Yeah, you know? Totally. Like, I know what I'm doing, right? Your parents barely want to do it, but they're your parents. And then you have some maybe aunts and uncles or yeah. neighbors to jump in the way that you did and say, I'm not going that route, I'm going to target a specific area, it was pretty impressive to me. So you heard like the highlight really, you didn't hear the whole story of how it came yeah, to be, right? So yeah, the cool thing about me getting into that industry during that time frame was I was all in, right? I still lived at home, I didn't have bills, I didn't have debt, I was, too stupid to realize failure was a legitimate option. Just, I never believed it wasn't going to work. I just thought it was put your reps in and things happen and just so kind of had blind faith in it. And the first shop that I worked at instilled in me just smile and dial and go and go and go. And it's a numbers game. And I just always believe that. When I came to my practice at Merrill, I believed the same thing, but I spent probably a year spinning my wheels and you know, the lesson that Lewis and I learned, and I think this is relatable into most businesses and probably most areas of life, is a lot of times the stories that you tell yourself are the things that are really holding you back, right? They're the stories you tell yourself, therefore you believe them, even though if they're not true. And then very times, that's the thing that's right in front of you that's the thing standing in your way. So for my partner, Lewis, who moved his practice out from New York and worked with some of the biggest companies, biggest Fortune 500 companies, C-suite executives in New York, transplants his business to Manasquan, New Jersey, 
More coyotes? Saying there's not that same opportunity set here. We got to work with one-on-one -on -one with people. We got to work with local business owners. We got to do the things that are different here because of where we are. And I believe that story. It's but the old firm told me too, one-on-one, -on -one, right? And it's like the idea of almost like hunting, right? Like not to talk about guns, but it's, it's pretty hard to hit one thing with one bullet. And it's pretty easy to hit one thing with one shotgun thing that has many, right? So you yeah, spent a lot that of took time. took a shot at Trump. He wasn't too good at shooting, uh, thank but God. Spent a lot of time trying to do that one-on-one -on -one and just shooting and missing. Proverbially or colloquially speaking, I don't know what the word is. Not that smart. We'd be canceled um, now. Right, probably. Sorry, guys. Um, but things really turned when we, we hit pause and we said, well, what worked for you there? Oh, you went and you found people that were like each other in the same setting that you could go see more than one person in the same day, right? Instead of driving all over the state to see one business owner who cancels on you and they go see another one, like, how can I find groups of people that have something in common in one location to see a bunch of them and just start to build in scale? And that early focus on scale has been really transformative in the business for us that I've been able to create a lifestyle for myself and my family and my kids that I'm really, really proud of. Like, I have a lot of free time. I don't have to miss things for my kids. But it goes back to that initial idea on scale. And for us, that started with business development efforts, right? So we simply drew a circle around our office of about 75 geographic miles and said, who are the biggest companies in here, right? With the recognition that all those companies have one thing in common for every single employee, and it's their benefits package. And any advisor worth their salt is going to spend a tremendous amount of time working with people that work within companies on their benefits packages, even if it's something that they're not going to get paid on because it's an integral part of that person's financial life. And we just said, what are the companies that our, our organization doesn't currently cover? How do we introduce ourselves to people and then recognizing that there's scale and building relationships within the walls of that organization? You just dropped a nugget. I did. I don't want to glaze over it. You get paid to do the things that you don't get paid to do. True. So when you go in and you help a client, speaking for advisors, understand their packet that they have mm -hmm. from their employer, that adds value to you. It may not pay you at that moment, but when they go and leave that employer or they get a large bonus or that restrictive cop stock comes due, mm -hmm. now you're paid because you're sitting there and you help them understand right. all these things that they have. And that applies to every industry. That's correct. You're a landscaper. You want to come back here. You want to help me with the pruning of my trees. You want to help the dead bush get revived. Mm -hmm. You want to throw some sod in. When I do the hardscape, you have earned that business. Correct. You know, they're cutting a the lawn. That's not what really pays their bills and gets them the boat and the different lifestyle that they want. That's just maintaining the bills and paying the staff. Mm -hmm. You have to do things and add value to others. And a lot of younger people that I have seen are a little shy. And I don't know if it's shy. I don't know if they don't know any better. But they're not willing to put in the work, not only just in our industry, in yeah. a ton of industries. And that's something that I have always done that led me to you know, where I am today. Yeah. So, so we built that out. and it was You started with you and Lewis mm -hmm. and an assistant? Yeah. Anna. Anna. From that point, tell us how you guys got to the size of the team that you have today and what type of hard work that took and the critical thinking it took. Um, so we screwed up for a number of years, like trying to figure out that next hire. Cause at face value, Lewis was like, oh, I just hired somebody that was like me and hiring Chris. And we're like, oh, let's just do that again. And we fell flat on our face for like four or five years, created a lot of problems, had issues with people that just didn't work out. Cause we just kept trying to hire ourselves. And where we kind of unlocked a new level was like when the light bulb went off we're like this isn't working let's just do the opposite let's hire anybody that's not like us but is kind of you know has the same vibe has the same goals has the same personality traits or could at least deal with us because we're very difficult personalities um, and we brought Courtney on board she worked with us as an assistant she's gone through you know various programs she's now the manager of the whole Manasquan office and killing it she's a senior vice president really successful advisor um, while still being a mom and on all these boards and stuff. And she's the glue that holds us all together. And that was the recognition of like, oh wait, we need to hire people that don't look and sound like us because we're capturing different markets. And we don't really care where our clients come from or who they are. We just care that they're with us. And you know, it was really interesting with Courtney because like the first three years when she came on with us, she was just closing clients that we had either lost or business that we just could never, we could never get. 
Like the people just didn't hit it off with us. But the second they heard from her, they were like, this all makes perfect sense. And none of us have an ego about it, right? We're just here to serve. So it's really cool to see that. So now it's like, as we look for those next hires, it's like, well, who's different than the three of us? What do they bring into the table? How do we pull them in? And it's been years of transition, but I think we have probably among the most solid team today of six that we've ever had. I don't um, disagree. You said another great nugget, serve. Totally. So the CEO of National Life, which is a company I utilize to do a lot of our pension work, mm-hmm. um, has a book out, and it's all about servant leadership. It's called Cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been in a lot of the airports around the country the last few years. Um, it's Mayor Anasati there with his hands out. It says, you know, Cause. You know, if you show up to a chairman's trip, which my wife is mad I skipped south of France this month, <laughs> uh, but Mayron is there handing you out your drink. Yeah. And he's there giving you a napkin and, like, really leads by servant leadership. And I think that's really who you are as a person. Totally. You like to serve others. And I think a lot of times we're so greedy, just naturally humans, we want more, we want it now. And we forget that if we give, we get. The whole basis of the podcast, Fireside, The Pit, is all about giving to get. I mean, the, the great relationships I have been afforded from doing this and people seeing me be consistent out of my own pocket mm-hmm. has been tremendous to my business and my family and the friends around me. And being being a servant and is not in a way that you should look at you're a servant, like that's looked down upon. No. You should serve others and that's always going to bring you all the things that you need in life, especially financially. From mowing lawns to working in restaurants to calling bonds to do what we do now, it's the only capacity I've ever worked in. It's all I ever know, right? And it's, it's interesting now is, is, you know, almost 40 doing okay and looking for other opportunities and things that garner my interest. Everything that I keep falling into is in that same vertical tree in some way, shape or form. So a young guy or girl coming up now, looking to get into a sales entrepreneur role, Mm -hmm. what would you say the number one important thing for them to do is? The number one thing to do. According to you, your opinion. It's probably the thing that I struggle the most with, right? Which is being that extrovert and connecting with people, right? And I, I, I'm really critical about this to myself because it's something I'm actively working on. But like, if we're in a social setting, if we're up in, in Manasquan for when they shut down Thursday night, the main street, and they have the car shows and everybody comes, and I see you there, I'm really good at coming up and saying, hey, Ryan. But if you're standing with somebody I don't know, hey, Ryan, how you doing, right? It's not wired into me. Say, oh, hey, I'm Chris. Well, like, you got to put yourself out there and you got to do that, right? And you're very good at doing that. I can tell you didn't build your business necessarily picking up the phone and going one-on-one. You built it in social settings. That's why you've got that skill set and that tool set there. I really, really struggle with it. I'm actively working on it. But I think that's the thing that I would give to anybody, right? Which is like recognize everybody around you and that there's always somebody new to meet and there's always opportunities to connect and, and grow. Yeah, build good relationships with good people. Yeah. Ends up being good for the pocket. Right. So... Where do you take the business from here? What, is, what does that look like? Where do you want to go? Do you want to bring on more young advisors? How long do you see, you see yourself doing this? What does that look like? So I was talking to a client about this today and I was like, I want to do this for as long as they'll let me keep doing this the way they are, right? Um, I'm really, really satisfied. I'm really, really happy in what I do. The business is fun, you know? I, I get to work with amazing families, amazing people. And like the byproduct of this that nobody really talks about, like everybody talks about finance, like you can make a good living, you have a lot of flexibility in your schedule, you can do all this, you can help people. But like the coolest thing about what I do is like, I get to help people that are actually like subconsciously or unconsciously mentoring me. Yeah. You like I get to see things. people, you get a lot of, I get to see, see a lot, lot of stuff, yeah. but I get to see a lot of people's really good habits and really great ideas and implement those 65 year old habits in my 37 year old life. Yeah. And I'm so much more ahead of where I should be as a result of that. And that's something that people would pay like hundreds of thousands of dollars in coaching for that like I get in being of service to this person. So I've had um, that question posed to me in the coaching. Yeah. And you know, mine's $10,000 as you know. Um, we do it over three months. I embed myself in their life. Mm-hmm. I get them to be vulnerable, 
point out blind spots, and then we go pick action steps to get to these goals. And a lot of times, I think people kind of sleep on me. It's okay. It used to be a big chip on my shoulder. Now I really like that. Yes. Um, but it was really all just stolen information and wisdom from the business owners I was working with. Mm -hmm. Lost partners, bad operating agreements, bad buy-sell agreements, you know, different investors, sales of real mm -hmm. estate, you know, the tax play. Like, I learned so much through my clients and then other experts in my world. Like, I'm just, you're lending me your information and then I Absolutely. can repurpose that to my people. And I think that's something that a lot of people maybe don't do nowadays. It's like, yeah. let me go online, let me segregate myself. And it's like in settings like this that we're all hanging out and creating friendships uh -huh. that we all learn what one another is good at and not good at. And um, that's something that you were obviously good at identifying quickly and early. Thank you. Giving you the success that you have. So we've talked a lot about business. You know, the second part, or last leg of the podcast, we like to talk about current events. Okay. We like to talk about what's going on. And you talked a lot about education earlier and your children. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about some of the you know historical issues that you know the government education, yeah. municipality education um, has going against them. But I've saw a lot of stuff that has disturbed my wife and I, a lot of our friends um, in the public school district. And again, I don't say this with a broad brush. There's amazing teachers out there, amazing superintendents, guidance Most. counselors. Yeah, like they are they are so underpaid. Same thing with cops, firemen. These people pay their civic duty to their country mm -hmm. and uh you know i don't think there's a teacher after 10 years that shouldn't be making at least one hundred fifty thousand dollars in this country yeah um that may not sound crazy but i know that we spend a lot more wasteful things like ukraine i don't know if i said that but there's a lot more wasteful things to be spending money on um, our kids education is extremely important and we've seen that kind of deteriorate over the last you know especially four to six years mm -hmm. drastically um how do you feel about what's going on and and our kids' schools and where it's going. So I actually feel super hopeful, right? And we're good friends, we talk all the time. You're gonna be like, Chris, what are you talking about? And the reason I feel super hopeful is because I feel like we're reaching an inflection point, right? Um, you can call it that. Right. I, I'm a big reader, right? Not well spoken, but I'm pretty well read. And there's, there's an author I love whose name is George Friedman. And George Friedman is, a global geopolitical strategist, and his job is to look at the events of the past and extrapolate for economies and global governments across the world, how is this going to replay and how should we position for it? And he's been right more often than he's been wrong. He's got some out there stuff too, but he's been pretty spot on. And the idea that I got from George years ago that has stuck with me for probably five or six years at this point is the idea that the, the solution to the last problem is the thing that eventually becomes your new problem. Right. And as it relates to education, like the solution to the problem started 200 years ago. We had an economy that went from agriculture to industrial production. We need to create a system of schooling for that. How do you teach people to be on time? How do you teach people to take tests? How do you teach basic arithmetic? How do you teach people to follow rules? How to respect authority? Finances. And that's now 200 years later and the economy's evolved, right? And it's been exacerbated through the for-profit public or private education system and the limitless debt that's issued to children since you know the 60s that really propagated insane inflated costs in that area. But I think like if I sit here today and say, is my oldest son Connor gonna be going to Ride University? It was $25,000 a year when I went there for $200,000 a year? Probably not. Right? And the delivery methods are changing. People's understanding of what needs to be taught is changing. And you have great people there, right? The solution to a lot of the problems in this country aren't like defund the police and aren't pay teachers less. It's like, these are the basis of your community. Strengthen them, pay them more. Give, like, make this an attractive profession to pull people into that you get the best people pushing your next generation forward. As you know, my wife, I do. The best thing in my life, my kid's life, was a teacher, math and special ed, mm -hmm. uh, as well as a master's in education. Very, very smart. Most people don't realize Kelly can drive through the city and count the window panes pretty quickly. <laughs> math mind, just naturally, um, really loves kids, um, her patients. She married me. 
Um, She's is, a saint. Is unmatched in my life ever. And, uh, you know, during COVID, we had to, you know, have her retire. Yeah. Because of what was going on in the education system, what was which was more based on, you know, the funding of a district based on who was pushing vaccines harder. Now, whether you mm -hmm. were for them or against them, it's all good. But I don't think any of those things should be pushed on children and hurt children or teachers from providing the next generation with some great education. Right. So things like vaccines, and you're being forced in a lot of these schools to sign off either a religious exemption or they just straight won't have you. Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but what do you think about things like that? I think it's really, there should be like a, chepar a separation of church and state, right? I understand public health policy and I understand theoretically everybody's working with the best information that they have at the time and this is something that's good. But I also sit here as somebody who, my cousin Jamie died from the vaccine that went wrong in the early 90s, right? From when they were doing live, you know, D DTAP vaccines, right? Um, so when you talk about supporting children hospital, or children's specialized hospital, that's something that's like super near and dear to my family's heart because we had somebody in our family that stayed there for 20 plus years and they were wonderful to her. So when you start talking about taking my ability to make a decision for my kids away from me, I'm gonna push back a little bit on that, right? Thankfully we haven't, at least where we live, had to combat that too much. I think we live in a place where people are pretty open-minded, but I don't think it's a place that you should have to have a parent choose between I'm going to send my kids to this place or they're going to have to do this thing that I don't want them to do. Yeah. Right? And that's where I think like the optimist in me says we're an inflection point where everybody can kind of sit back and say, listen, maybe we're all not as at odds as we, as we think we are. Maybe we all have a little bit more in common than we really think we do. And like, we can all agree that the world's getting a little bit crazy. Like how do we chill out a little bit and, and bring this back to where we're all working and kind of rowing in the same direction? Yeah. And I'm going to, Drill down a little bit further. You have, you know, kids with a lot of gender issues. One of the other reasons Kelly's, you know, left the public school district. She had a child that was a girl that went to a boy that went to a furry, and uh, thought she was a cat. You know, family was demanding, you know, a kitty litter box, and things of that nature. If those things continue, where your kids may go to school, and right now you're not seeing that, thank yeah. God, because of the great areas that we are in. Um, would you consider putting your kid into a smaller pod? Because forever, I always thought the kids that were homeschooled were weirdos. Mm -hmm. um, my Aunt Peggy, to give her some love, she's a pastor. My uncle's a pastor, mm -hmm. a military guy, old school, live in Alabama. The kids were homeschooled, and I'm like, you know, you're crazy, Aunt yeah. Peggy. But Aunt Peggy, like, had it pegged. Mm -hmm. uh, no pun intended. Like, yeah. she knew what was going on. And now Kelly and I, you know, don't know, although we're in a great town like Wall, they have a, an amazing elementary school from all the great things we hear over in Allenwood, you know, we really don't think our kid will go to public school. Do you ever see yourself potentially putting your kid in one of those programs like a pod? Anything's possible. Um, you know, I think the beauty of 2024 is alternative options do exist, right? And that's where I'm saying I think we're at an inflection yeah, Trump, point, right? It exists. Trump for sure, but I'm just saying in terms of education, like I had the opportunity to meet Matt Boudreau probably five years ago when they were just starting to get Apogee off the ground. And I remember I came home because I'm a crazy person. I'm like, Nicole, we got to open one of these schools. This is the greatest thing ever. And she's like, our son is one. What are you talking about? Like, no, we're not going to do this. And sure enough, there's potentially a couple opening in our area now. Thank God for and uh, Nicole. Listen, I just, I love that options and alternative exist for people. I think freedom of choice is a great thing. Um, but I also think that's one of the values of putting yourself in as good of a financial position as you can be in, because then you have options to pursue these things, Boom. right? It's never a better time to get rich. And yes, get rich. Yeah. If you think that's mean or we're arrogant saying that, everybody has the ability to get rich in America still. It's shrinking, but it's still there more than any other country in the world. And when you have money, you have options. That's great. Right. And that's something that Kelly and I will work really hard to. You know, I got the bill from Genesis, which is the new company that took over Atlantis Prep, mm -hmm. which they do an excellent job. Shout, Shout out, out to Ms. Miller. Atlantis Prep, Ms. Miller, Ms. Ms. Miller, Ms. Devereaux. Miller, Atlantis Prep. I heard you guys are going to be watching the pod. We give you nothing but love. Our kids love you. They've been great to us. Yeah, they're, they're an amazing school. If you are in the Monmouth County area, Ocean County, you know, get your kids over to Atlantis Prep and Absolutely. do an awesome job. Um, we 
have worked very hard to have those dollars set aside. And I saw this transaction come through yeah. for X amount of dollars. And I'm like, oh, damn, you're like, this is expensive. I got mm -hmm. another kid that's coming up in a few years. But thankfully, we have worked very hard together as a team mm -hmm. to be able to have those resources to put our kids, you know, with the best foot forward. You know, I see things like, you know, you know, teaching kids about DEI and all of these other programs that are being pushed down through a lot of different school districts. Some of the school districts in New Jersey have actually put into place where they can help your kid transition their gender and not tell you uh, under the age of 18 years old. Mm -hmm. That is very disturbing to me. Um, I saw a really well written article the other day. A girl was a very you know, big tomboy as a, as a younger girl. Um, if these types of things were going on, she probably would have questioned what she had. She wrote it out and she was gorgeous. There was a picture of her nowadays. I think she was like 28 years old. Mm -hmm. Absolutely stunning. Very successful. Um, still love sports. Would consider herself a tomboy internally. But she's like, if all this was going on, I would have been very confused at the time. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have people pushing that on me. I was allowed to grow up as a kid. And to talk about church and state, we have another big helicopter coming here in a second. Um, you got to let kids be kids. Yes. And uh, I just wish that the public schools and the U.S. government would understand that. Like, we're in a free country. Just a second here. What we got there? Hackensack? A little loud. We got the airport over here. So the fireside helicopter is going to be in a couple years. Um, those are very good answers. Well thought out. And I think a lot of people can get some education on that. <laughs> so next part of my political part of the podcast that relates to business. So we see all of the economic turmoil that we have experienced the last three years, high inflation. Um, when's rates going to come down? Middle class people, you know, really struggling. You know, I don't even like to see the food bill. Mm -hmm. like Kelly does that because... It'll make me crazy if I see the cost. And thankfully, we're in a position to go to Trader Joe's and Costco and ShopRite and get the things that our family need to live healthy. Sure. And um, besides bourbon, that's not healthy, but it's also expensive. Yeah. It's, um, what'd you say, Matt? Now you, now you messed up my, what'd you say? Dutch Hill Farm. Dutch Hill Farm, Shout yeah. Shout out Dutch Hill Farms. Dutch Hill. Organic. They kill the chicken Sunday and they're in his fridge by Wednesday. Best chicken I've ever mm -hmm. had. But now you lost me. What was I saying? Oh, you're going on about food. Food, yes. You're lucky we can, like, go buy our groceries. You're lucky we can go buy the groceries. It's so expensive. Middle yeah. class is struggling. You know, how do, we, how do we look at the landscape of what's going on out there politically, and how does that relate to business and the economy without giving any type of investment advice? <laughs> so first off, anything we're talking about is exclusively my opinion, right? It's not that of my business partners or my firm or any of our affiliates, uh, right? Did he talk to uh, a lawyer before he came on? <laughs> Investment products did are not bank guarantee. They're not FDIC insured. They may lose value. And uh, nothing here should be misconstrued as a solicitation for business or investment advice, right? Um, the short answer to all that we'll is speed that I up actually the edit. have no idea, right? Um, do you think who's president really plays a role in what goes on in people's pockets? No. Not really. Um, what about this election? You know, I think when you watch election cycles, you see presidents up there making potential presidential nominees, making all these broad claims, right? And how they're going to help everybody and do all these really big things. And I think when you look back in history at every president we've ever had, and there's been about 46 of them, right now 47 okay 47 pretty good went for 10 o'clock at night when i'm usually in bed at seven uh, trump was the 46th and 47th okay whatever you say 46 47 right they had broad <laughs> things that they were going to do but they really accomplished one or two major things along the way um when you look at Trump's presidency, like everybody thinks of all the craziness that happened and he wants to talk about, you know, the wall and the stock market and this and other thing. But he created this thing called the Tax Cups and Jobs Act, right? Which did help everyone. And the thing that makes me crazy about the debates now is they're like, oh, you're going to give tax cuts for billionaires and millionaires. You can look at that tax package and this is not tax advice. And it's well documented that that's a tax package that unequivocally lowered taxes for every American at every level of income. Pretty black and white. It's pretty black and white. Yeah. 
can't deny it. So I think that was something that helped the average person. Getting rid of that's probably going to hurt the average person. The question is, if that goes away, what's the offset? Right? Because I don't see how it could continue to get worse. And like, I'm just all in on this idea of the pendulum swinging. And I hope we're at the far end and we're going to come back to the middle. Just want to point out, majority of billionaires fund Harris and Biden. They don't fund the Trump campaign. So it's if, above my pay grade. If billionaires, <laughs> I'm not, it's not coming from you, it's coming from me. If billionaires are being helped and or being hurt and the regular guys, I kind of follow just by logic and street smart. Well, who are they backing? Dick Cheney just came out. That's fair. You know, all of the people that are in the, you know, industrial complex in this country and how the world has gone around uh, are supporting I, one side. I think they're on all sides. But they're, they're definitely on all <laughs> sides, maybe. Maybe not. You know, for me, the question is, can who's president influence? Probably to some degree, right? But I think that there's trends at play that are going to happen regardless of who's in the administration, right? Like when you yeah, think there's about... There's always money to be made. Right, but when you think about the United States, like AI is a real thing theoretically, right? Like it's, it's the next version of the internet. And there's an infrastructure that's going to support that. And we have a crumbling infrastructure of roads and tolls that were created 50 years ago and our electrical grid is on popsicle sticks on the side of the road. Like all this needs to be fixed to make this next thing happen. And that's going to happen regardless of who the president is, right? So theoretically, like I think there's a bigger tidal wave that kind of takes the direction of the country than just this one person who has this modicum of influence along the way. I know who I like, I know who I'd like to see, I'd feel better one can under versus the other, and so like? would other people, right? Um, who do you like? Who do I like? I'm an independent. <laughs> you like RFK? I do like RFK. Yeah. I really like Tulsi Gabbard. I like her too. I've been sending all of my friends that are voting opposite ways of what I would vote her latest book, and they're all enlightened. I just <laughs> heard her talking at a conference, maybe in Hawaii, wherever it was, um, and she said she was put on the secret terror watch list. I saw that. And it was like crazy the way that she was describing it. She's like, I have a military ID. I have top clearance. Mm -hmm. I'm in Congress and Senate. Uh, I ran for president. I've been on some of the most secretive meetings. Mm -hmm. And it took me like 10 or 15 times of being searched like mm -hmm. four times throughout the airport process before getting on my plane to realize that something was going on. Um, and I simply believe that's because she stood up to, you know, you know, the institution or yeah. the deep state or the shadow government, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I hate to see things like that. I think she's a really true patriot. Um, I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, independent. I love to see patriots standing up. I love to see guys like RFK joining hands with Trump. He's an imperfect man on all fronts. The debate showed it the other night. He's, mm -hmm. he's baited easily. And... Um, but he's done a lot of great things. And yeah. uh, I like to see people like Tulsi, RFK, Tucker, Trump all come together for the benefit of future America. Anybody that's in the same agenda as us, right? Which is, I want to kind of be left alone. I want to keep more of my money for myself. I want to raise my family the way I want to raise them. I want to feel safe. Doesn't... I want to be able to pay for things. I don't think that's that crazy of an idea, but where we are today, that feels unattainable for a lot of folks. And that's a problem. They don't want creative people who think freely and can gain power through money. Which goes back to the structure of that education system changing and the fact that it's a wonderful thing that alternatives exist. And those things are becoming more and more viable and more and more respected and better and better every day. So we'll see what happens. Very good. I choose to be hopeful. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, we have to be, right? Unless it's the end of times, but who knows? Don't get me started on that nuclear book yeah, I've been reading. Read that That's book. crazy. I'm very depressed lately. Is that the girl that was on Sean Ryan? Annie Jacobson, yeah. Yeah, she's extremely intelligent. I thought she was like a general or any intelligent. It is community. the most captivating thing I've listened to in What's the years. What's book called? Uh, nuclear, a scenario. nuclear Scenario. But it is terrifying. Yeah. And you will be depressed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're closer to that than ever. I, I did a reel a few weeks ago. Biden had the Pentagon start running nuclear games. So... If, scary. You know, we popped off and shot Russia, China, and North Korea. How quick would the world end? And I think it was like a 99.99% .99 chance that everybody died. Dude, the, the best theory that the world has come across with nine nuclear superpowers has been this idea that deterrence is our thing. Like, you're not going to do it because I'm not going to do it because it's going to be bad for both of us. I'm like, that doesn't feel like the best answer we could have. I think about Putin, 
Xi Jinping, Trump, eh, all have big egos. You know, if someone pushes someone too far, um, they say, fuck it. Putin's lived a full life. Trump's lived a full life. I've lived a pretty full life, but I'd like to live a more full life. Yeah, so, kids. like, maybe we could avoid this. You have kids. I thought your answers were very well thought out, um, very fair um, and educational. I, I learned a little bit more about you and how you think and that. And uh, I thank you for that. I obviously am trying to push for some good content. <laughs> and uh, I loved your answers. Again, you're always well thought out. Last two questions I like to ask everybody. And we're going to start to switch these up. But okay. the first one, is there anybody else? Obviously, you gave your, your mother and father some great love and your, your wife, Nicole, mm -hmm. who's amazing, your children. Who's some other people you want to give some love to? My entire team at Merrill, my wife, obviously, my entire team at Merrill, right? They put up with us. You know, Lewis has been one of my best friends, person always believed in me, great mentor. Um, dude, just, we live in an awesome community. Yourself, members of the pit, feel really privileged to just have a lot of great relationships, so. You do. I got to talk louder on the next podcast. Okay. You're a little quiet over there. Second question. I'm introverted. I know, I've never been know. on camera. I'm pulling it out. You should have one more beer. <laughs> Second question. If you could tell any young entrepreneur, entrepreneur, and this is a similar question I asked earlier, what's the one thing that they should focus on? Whether it be just jumping in and taking action, you know, getting huh? in with a good mentor, what is the one thing you would tell them? Whatever it is that you're doing, I don't care what it is, try and get through as many no's as you possibly can. Because the more no's you hear, the closer you are to a yes. And then on the back side of that, no is not finite, right? Doesn't mean never, just kind of means not right now, right? And that was always my theory when I was getting out there trying to build our, our, our book is like, no, it doesn't mean never. It means not right now. Like, and unless you're the person that's like cursing me out and telling me you hate me and tell me to jump off a bridge, like, doesn't, I'm going to fall up in six months and maybe we're on a better day that day. Um, so that's always something that resonated with me. Great answer. Listen, this has been a great discussion. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, two questions. Like, you also always ask my favorite question, which you're going to like, politely avoid right now, which is like, what other businesses do you love in the area? This is a small business podcast. I'm just going to throw that I one out the window. I changed it up. You know I got Real Dentistry sitting here. I got West Realty sitting here. I have Haas Media sitting here. And I have a whole host of other businesses that I was ready to shout out. And you're just going to skip over. Well, you just did it for me. No, I've got more. All right, what else you got? Obviously, we got to shout out the butcher. We right? did. Dutch Hill. We said Dutch we said. Hill Farms is phenomenal. Matt and Michelle are great people, veteran owned, family owned business, no better meat, right? He was on the front lines of Fallujah, that guy. Right. Why are we going to shout out the facilities? Red Balloon Consignment in Manasquan. Phenomenal store giving you great branded goods for your kids when you can't afford anything in this economy. Yeah, especially right? snowboard outfits. Right? Very expensive. Why aren't we going to shout out me who stepped out of my comfort zone because of you? I stroked a check to Dave West. Lauren and Grace from Cardinal Provisions on this great restaurant concept that's partially open right now at Bellworks and opening at the end of the month called Mabel. Is there 10% to the big guy for that check? Probably, right? But it's going to be a wonderful restaurant in Homedale called Mabel. It's beautiful. European coastal inspired it. food. We have a great bar open right now with awesome cocktails. We the do. restaurant is going to be phenomenal in its opening end of this month. And you're not going to give me the opportunity to shout that out? I mean, I could add one more to that, Finn's. Let's go Finn's. I love Finn's. Finn's has been one of the most, and I love Bubba Coos. Um, Surf Taco, not as much of a fan anymore. But Finn's has done an excellent job. Two very hardworking guys mm -hmm. that have been through hell as partners. Another partnership. I've had a partner in the past. He's a great man, a good dad. Um, but partnerships are tough. They're extremely difficult. They're like marriages. Yeah, they're like marriages, and you gotta have the right documentations before you get into those marriages. A little not legal advice. Well, uh, no <laughs> legal advice. Call Mike Gorman. You need to have two special humans to grow what Pat and Sean have at Finns. I've been on those guys for 15 years. Franchise, 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 and Sean just like, eh, shut up, Ryan. Eh, shut up, Ryan. They finally have done it. I got the word two days ago. I could talk about it. We're going to have them on to talk further about it. 
Um, I love fins. There's fins not is, a better chicken quesadilla with they, marinated they, chicken. They, restate, they, they actually tell you exactly what you ordered back to you. Uh -huh. I have the worst luck when people give me the wrong order. Ask my wife. And I think it's like non-GMO, organically raised, and they never talk about that. He doesn't talk about it enough. We're going to get Pat. Pat may or may not have been given too much bourbon in the last episode. We're going to keep him limited to light beer. Okay. Um, and Sean has this like money mind, this accounting mind that comes natural to him. So the front of the house, back of the house, great thing. Um, there's All a right, couple. So shout out fence. We, we shout we, out fence. Listen, no, we want to talk about. There's a couple areas locked down with the franchise race. Stone Harbor's taken. A um, couple of the locations. I mean, you got me started. We're giving people love. Shout out real dentistry. Look at that teeth. Look at those. No, oh, shout out the pit, all right? The <laughs> shout pit, out the pit. The pit got you like $50,000 teeth for free. That. Look at that. <laughs> Make sure we drop a little Brielle down. That'll be my thumbnail. Alon, his whole team. Alon's here tonight. All right. Sarah. The, Reggie's here. Regina's here. Whole crew's here. We don't want to get into the dogs. Sarah's here. The dogs. Trump is protecting dogs also, not just cats. Or not sure. That was seagulls. fact checked. Uh, Fireside Media real. fact checked it. It's real. Make sure you follow Fireside Media. All right. Listen, Is that a wrap? I'm not done with a wrap. <laughs> I want to just simply say this. All kidding aside, I'm not going to fucking stop ever. I like to fight. I like to be put against the wall. It's what I know how to do. It keeps me out of trouble. We're going to continue to bring small business owners on here. Yep. Have them tell their stories, give education, and not just sift their own farts. Give real information, tough stories. So people who are watching this can say, I walked a parallel path to Chris or Trevor or Ryan or right. anybody else that shows and sits up in these chairs, you and, my, and me, and just continue to plow forward in this. Because if a lot more people in America know how to simply say, I can leave my job or I can become an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and control my own P&L inside of a large organization, the more freedom people are going to have to live the way that you are blessed to, myself and all of our friends that are here tonight. Absolutely. You, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep stroking big checks. Um, I don't make a dollar off of any of these things. I've lost money every single event that we have thrown. Um, kind pr people like yourself have come in and stroked checks and helped me with that. And uh, I just ask anybody else who's out there and you guys are you know, down with what we're pushing. Mm -hmm. um, we need sponsorship for this podcast. I've never asked for it. I never asked for a dime. Um, the people in my life who have stepped up, Atlantis, um, um, Atlantic PT, Atlantic PT, Thrive, um, Tommy White. Um, shout out Tommy White. Shout out to Tommy. He's a crazy man. Um, <laughs> just a ton of business owners. I, I don't have them all off the top of my, my, my mind now. Um, when we first threw the event, we had $3,500 sponsorships for a guy who was essentially a nobody. Mm -hmm. I had no followers at the time. I just launched the podcast. We had 15 $3,500 sponsorships with only 135 people in the crowd who paid $500 or $750 to go to both events. I don't know if I'm going to throw the event again next year, but the podcast is, is going to keep pushing on, and we need some sponsors. Totally. Um, and I know for a fact, just like you have experience and everybody else in the ecosystem has experience, don't sleep on me. You'll get paid back tenfold. Um, Alon and Brielle Dentistry has been extremely you know kind to us he's got a free membership for life in the pit you know couples retreat no problem stroke a check the event sponsorship um just a ton of people have been very helpful but we need more i don't have tens of millions of dollars yet when i do i'll have a helicopter but we need some more yeah, i think to get elon involved. and i edited it up before we need 500 million because we're going to invent the new novocaine that doesn't taste bad well what did patrick Bed that's David our next said? idea <laughs> time out what did patrick Bed david said that for him to take a similar mission that we're on at value he needed a billion dollars he needed a billion dollars yeah and he said his number one issue right now was recruiting mm -hmm. so recruiting top talent from the consulting firms that are out there today mm -hmm. and then having enough money to have the proper software to push out his agenda mm -hmm. um so think big i'm thinking big i need your help I love you like a friend, good friend, brother. Um, this was awesome. Thank you for being here. Cheers. Cheers.